We want to touch on a few things related to the financing process. I guess sort of uh, when do you start find, you know the financing process? What's the right process to, to go through? How do you get to that first term sheet? And then sort of how do you negotiate it? What's the best way to optimize valuation and returns? Yeah, so um, so I'm a partner at IVP. We're a later stage fund only. So most of the work that I'm doing is investing in companies that have already raised you know, one or two rounds of funding. So the, the process is a little different for, for that stage than the earlier stage. Um, but I, I think what's what's sort of applicable in, in almost every stage of, of, uh, of negotiation and, and investing is that the investment process is actually oddly like dating. And uh, I was like terrible at high school dating, so I, don't, I probably suck at this job too. But but in, in the dating process, you know, there's a lot of, especially if you're a company, um, in some sense, you know, you want to give the appearance that, that you've got a lot of options from the investors out there. If you come to an investor and say, you know, you're my only hope, I'm running out of cash in a week, can you fund me? Uh, you know, as much as, as, as uh, that might be attractive, uh, it actually, you know, it's much better to say, I'm not really looking for investment right now, I'm taking my time, but if I meet the right person, if I meet the right investor, I might actually consider taking capital. So investors want to feel like, like investing in your company is a privilege, is something that is a scarce resource, and it's really important as an entrepreneur to try to create that through through the process and, and really never raise money when you need it, raise money when it can help accelerate your business. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, as a as a lawyer to start companies, I would not advise you go hat in hand. That's not the best uh, strategy for optimization. How do you suss out when, when, I mean, so obviously in the negotiations, leverage is everything. There's perceived leverage and there's actual leverage. As a, as a VC, how are you able to sort of suss out when a company may not actually have the options that they're presenting? Well, I mean, I think we're, we don't like to play games with the company. So I, I, there's other firms, I, I talked to another investor who had this great story about how, how he actually plays hard to get with a company and he'll meet a company and they'll say, you know, I would love to invest, but you know, we're, we're probably going to be way too low on valuation. I'm not the right investor. You know, I'm on all these other boards and it actually makes the company go, no, 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 you're, you're right for me. I want to, you know, how can we work together? Um, I, I don't like playing those games. So we focus a little more on, on the fundamentals of the business. Do we, do we like the business? Is it a strong company? And, you know, how do we feel after we invest sitting at the, in the boardroom? So we try to think a lot about, you know, when you pull up a chair to the board meeting and you just paid, you know, 100 or 200 or $300 million for a company, does that feel like you're in a good starting position where you can make money as an investor? And, and the best investments aren't ones where we come out of it going, oh my God, we really just got such a good deal. I mean, we, those guys are terrible negotiators. Um, the best ones are actually where both parties feel like it's a fair valuation. We're all starting in a place where the entrepreneur gets what he wants. We're in a place where we can make money. And uh, you don't want the entrepreneur feeling like, you know, wow, I just I gave up half my company that you know, I didn't need to. So Yeah, no, totally. The, the over-optimization game is, is never a fun one. Uh, one of the things that, that I talk to and, and counsel entrepreneurs on is, you know, this isn't a zero-sum game, right? You, you, you have equity and you have a product and you have a company that you've built. And the investors very much want a piece of that, and you very much want their money, but you want to make sure they're the right partner. You sort of you liken the, the fundraising process to a, to a dating process. How do you how do you, how do you advise? How would you advise? If you took your hat off and put it on the entrepreneur. How would you advise them to evaluate potential VCs? Yeah, I mean, so one of the surprising things that that very few entrepreneurs do are uh, is reference checking on the venture firm. So we, we spend all of our time digging through the financials of a business, calling customers of a company, doing you know, reference checks on management, and, uh, and we often offer up references on our comp on, on, uh, when we're meeting a company because we want them to, to better understand us. And you know, it's incredibly rare that a company actually says, you know, I, give me three references, and they not only ask, you know, if, you're, if you're actually doing reference checking, you know, don't just ask for the references that the CEO or that the venture firm gives you, wants to give you. Ask for specific situations where uh, the venture firm invested in a company that didn't go well and find out how they, how they acted in situations that were actually challenging. You know, you learn a lot about a person, not, not when times are good, but actually in sort of the darkest moments when 
you know, they're worried about losing all their money or the company needs to shut down or there's big management changes. Um, I think that's where, where really venture investors are, are worth their, their, their weight. And, uh, you know, I think doing reference checking in those situations is really critical. And, and I think same with, with entrepreneurs, you know, I want to hear about situations that actually didn't work historically and, and how you dealt with challenges. Right, and for entrepreneurs, that's one of the one of the ways you can sort of get the, um, the the free information about the VCs is it's all it's all online. You know, like any other recommendation or referral, you're gonna you're gonna give somebody a, a, a reference that's you know that's gonna say great things about you. But you but you can go around that. You can go you can go you can find who who, who they invested in, who hasn't who, who isn't on this list, who who should I who, who are they who are they not shining the light. And you could ask them, and you know, to Jules's point, one of the things you can do to sort of manufacture, you know, not a not a hard to get, but at least present the position of uh, negotiating leverage is, is to ask those questions. It's like, hey, you know, I'm also evaluating you as a as a VC. You know, let me, you know, let, let me let me check you out. I'm not just here for the taking. Yeah, and I think I, creating, you know, it's interesting around that point about how you get the VC to move, and this this idea of actually creating artificial scarcity in your company. So if you're, if you're a company, you're raising money, the, the round that you're raising is actually a really scarce event because if you're raising $5 million or $10 million, you know, that's not, you're not a public company. An investor can't just buy your stock every day. You know, there's a really rare opportunity to invest. And so this idea of creating this artificial scarcity and then bounding that in time, and so in an artificial way. So in some sense, you, know, you, you need a million dollars the, the message to investors shouldn't be, I want to raise a million dollars over the next six months or a year, because investors will just wait as long as possible and get as much information as possible. This idea of saying, I'm raising a million dollars, I've, I've got you know, a bunch of meetings this week, you're behind, so you got to catch up, and uh, I'm going to make a decision. We have a board meeting, or I'm going to make a decision on next Wednesday. All of a sudden, it, as an investor, you feel, wow, I either have to move or this opportunity is gone and it's not going to be around for another year or two years when a company's next raising funding. And, and, and even better than, than creating artificial um, you know, urgency is to run a, run a process, run a fundraising process that, that actually is designed to create actual opportunity, uh, actual bidding. A lot, of, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of founders that I work with, you know, at least until we talk, have some some sort of a, a happy-go-lucky haphazard approach to the to the fundraising process, as opposed to you know more of a more of a structured approach where you you target you know three or four VCs who, who you're interested in taking money from. You approach them all and you start them along the process at the same time, because generally, and, and Jules, jump in if I'm, I'm mistaken here. Uh, VCs take you know they have they have they have the same process that, that they go through. They evaluate. They do they do the business due diligence. That there's going to be a partner meeting. It's a two or three week process before you know from introduction to even even potentially being in a position to, to offer up a term sheet unless you're a super you know Snapchat type company where, where people are throwing term sheets at you right and left. And, and what what you'd like to do is you'd like to have all all of those VCs in that cohort that you're that you're targeting ready or in a similar position in terms of their process to so that when you get that first term sheet. You're not just you're not just sort of out there, you know, twisting in the wind, negotiating with one person. You can actually play that off of the other VCs and create that urgency. And and I don't think that's you know game playing. I mean that's that's sort of the you know that's sort of the supply and demand. You know. Yeah, and it's funny. I mean, business, right? we you know it, in some sense it is some it is some game plan. It is artificial scarcity. But as a venture firm, and maybe this is true of dating in some sense too. Like you want to be. You want to be played. Yeah. <laughs> you want the company to actually, you know, have the sophistication to treat it like a process. To because uh, because you know if they're doing things like that where they're they're able to get people to invest, um, it's going to help you when the company is next raising money. If you're an investor, it probably helps when they're convincing clients. And so you know the, the ability of of selling uh, the sales role of a CEO is critical in, in everything, including the, the fundraising process. Um, but I, I think what's interesting, I mean, you talked about that couple week thing. You know, I, I, I would not let the venture firm dictate the timing. Right. I would instead try to push the firm as quickly as possible. We, we actually invested in, in Snapchat and also in Twitter. And, and in Twitter, we invested in early 2009. Um, you know, the company was initially not thinking about raising money. Um, we met the company at, uh, 
on a Monday, we actually had a, an entire partner meeting for our first meeting with the company. You know, we liked it so much, we were there all day on Tuesday, and we had a term sheet on Wednesday for the company. So it wasn't a multi-week process, but we know they, they said, hey, look, if you can move fast and, and you're ready, um, you know, we'd like to move forward. So I think not, not sort of waiting on the venture firm, but pushing them to yeah. go quickly. Yeah, and I think some of that is stage dependence as well, right? If you're a later stage company, you already have, you know, investors and board members around the table that you, you know, and, uh, you know, other institutional investors and you've got a track record that you're running off of. It, it can be a much quicker process because you're sort of, you've got the right metrics that you can easily benchmark, you know, for earlier stage companies, perhaps raising their first round. You know, it can be, it can be a, a little bit more of an in-depth due diligence process, at least on the, on the business side. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. And, um, you know, I think one of the, the interesting tactics, especially at the early stage side, I had a, uh, you know, I was, I went to business, I went to undergrad at Yale in uh, 2001 and, um, and uh, I went to business school at Stanford and one of the professors I had there was this guy, uh, Andy Ratcliffe, who was a partner at Benchmark, one of my mentors and someone I really respect in venture. And uh, he had this really funny quote about early stage fundraising. And he says, um, if you ask an early stage VC for money, you get advice. Because a lot of times they say no, but oh, what you really should be doing is this business. But if you actually ask an early stage venture firm for advice, you don't always get money, but sometimes you do. So actually going to a venture firm with the orientation that I'm not looking for money, uh, and it's probably true of also recruiting, you know, I'm not looking for a job, but I'd really like to, to just tell you more about my business. And every once in a while, I mean, when we're meeting companies, we know in the back of our mind, we might be funding them. I mean, we're evaluating that business, and we might say, you know what, actually, I, I heard the pitch, I know you're not raising money, but is, is there a way we could invest? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you've shifted the conversation. That's, that's the ideal. Hey, I think we have about 10 minutes left. I'd love to open it up to, to questions. Yeah, and you know, my advice to entrepreneurs is, is ask. You know, very few entrepreneurs actually ask, how do you make decisions? Um, because some firms, especially earlier stage firms, if a single partner wants to invest in the company, that partner will be able to. They'll have sort of an allocation. They can do one or two companies a year, or if it's a seed investment, they don't need approval from the rest of their partners. And so when they give you a term sheet where they say, I'm investing in your business, you can take their word for it. At our firm, we're an equal partnership. We've got six partners, but we're all equal. One partner, one vote. So when we uh, need to invest in a company, we need to get that company in front of our partnership, which is, we talked about in Twitter, isn't a difficult thing, but we need to do that. And then literally after the meeting, we all sit around and, and we vote. And it doesn't mean we stop doing our work after the vote, but it does give the point partner authorization to move forward. And so we're actually, I've had trouble with companies and, and when, why I'm trying to be more explicit with our process now is a lot of times I'll meet a company, I'll personally be excited about it, they'll think, wow, the deal with IVP is done, and I'll need to tell them, look, you know, we're an equal partnership, this is the next step in the process, I'm your advocate, I'm gonna help you, but ultimately, you know, you need to convince the entire firm, and if you do convince the entire firm, you also get the full resources of the firm behind you. It's a good thing for you as an entrepreneur. Which, uh, which companies are extending the most right now? Like, what particular characteristics? Yeah, um, in our portfolio, I mean, I think. Or maybe outside your portfolio. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I think uh, everything mobile. I mean, it's amazing. I do so much internet investing that that the internet space, the desktop internet space, is almost really started dying, and, and really, it's it's. Uh, Everything's about mobile, and if you look at the traffic patterns underlying companies, um, a lot of traffic's moving to mobile. So, so we really like um, we invested in Snapchat about a year ago um, because we really like the the trends of that becoming the social platform of choice for teens and, and ultimately, I think for everybody. Um, and the new update, I know it's gotten a lot of press. I think is awesome, and and uh, um, I think more and more people of, of my generation, um, I'm in my mid thirties, will will I think eventually start using Snapchat. So I think that's um, 
that's really important. And I think it also helped with our Twitter investment. We liked that it was a mobile-first platform. So we're seeing a lot of stuff in mobile. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of freemium business models or, or sales models in the enterprise that don't require significant um, sales, uh, heavy a sales investment. And uh, I think it's interesting. We're, you know, we're, I don't know if, if people are following the multiples in the stock market now or watching everything decline, but um, you know, for the longest time, nobody was focused on um, sales efficiency of enterprise companies. It it's almost, almost didn't matter how much you were burning. You know, if you're burning 50 million or 100 million, as long as you're growing, you're fine. Um, I think what's starting to change, uh, we're starting to see that change that people are starting to dig into, well, how efficient is a dollar of sales or marketing expense in your business and what's the return on that? And so that's why I tend to like models that just have, you know, beautiful software, beautiful uh, product that's, that's simple and easy to, to buy. So I think that's a, a trend that we'll just see more and more in the enterprise. Also, what are the reasons that, like, you either pick a tech model or possibly not one? How is this one different from, like, 2000? Yeah, I wrote, I graduated at one, so I got to ride the bubble on the way down, which was not fun. So uh, I had, uh, I worked for a bank called Robertson Stevens, and, um, half of our analyst class, uh, so I got my offer in 2000, half of our analyst class had their offers rescinded uh, before we graduated, the week before the L graduation. Um, my roommate, who was, we were moving together, he had his offer rescinded, so it was, um, it was a terrible situation. And, and uh, But that, that, I think that was really different. And if you look at, like, I, I've seen some stats recently, if you look at the, the median revenue, uh, median like uh, revenues of a company that went public in 2000, I mean, it, it was like, Technology was like sub 20 million. It was so small, and today it's 100 million. So the, the type of company is better. Um, so I, I don't love the term bubble, but but we were in an inflated multiple environment where companies that were doing 100 million dollars of revenue or even 10 million were being valued at, at multiples and valuations that were so much higher than they probably ought to have been, and um, and that's contracted by 30 to 50 percent in the last month. We also notice a trend towards recurring revenues here versus definitely. The I, mean, duck. I mean, that's that's more valuable revenue, I would think. Yeah, you you probably see it too. I mean, um, I mean, venture firms are like inherently conservative. There's a reason that um, that we're doing this job where we get to invest in like ten or twenty companies instead of like putting all of our our life into one business. And, and when you're a little more conservative, you tend to like um, businesses that have visibility in their revenue. Which is a good thing. So having a recurring revenue model is, is really great. Um, so there's this idea that went out of the venture firm invests at the early stage, uh, putting a really significant amount of money and just kind of gets a foot in the door and it's got a second venture with optionality. But then, you know, if they end up deciding not to do a follow on the leader, we create this negative signaling problem. So you talk about that a little bit. I think you said it. So, <laughs> so the question mean, he said, uh, like, uh, if you don't have that objection, you really like a company and say, well, listen, you're not going to guarantee that it's going to come on with you. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's just it, it's inherent in the investment. Like you said, there 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 isn't going to be a sort of a call right on the on the Series A if they're making a, a, a Series C investment. But it's definitely something to it's definitely something to keep in mind. And if you want to, you know, sort of. Diversify that by taking you know money from a, a couple of institutions so that you can at least have one of them lead or participate in the next round. That's great. Uh, you know, I, I will say there is there is you know among entrepreneurs uh, in doing Series C rounds, uh, a lot of times they'll discuss, hey, should we avoid taking institutional investors' money for that? exactly that reason? We can cobble together a little bit less money, but from from less marquee names, should we do that? And I think the trend is is leading that way. Yeah, not, and don't just take one investor. If you take one investor and they don't invest one institutional investor, they don't invest, it's a really strong signal. But if you take two or three, uh, and and uh, then they're all fighting against each other to be able to leave your, your next round. Don't take strategic money early, not early. All right, we'll just do one more question and then. Are you a strategic investor or? No, okay. <laughs> It's a good question. So, uh, you know, I, I would say that strategics are investing for different reasons than institutional investors. They're strategic for a reason. So um, let's say they're a big retail company. They may want visibility and kind of new trends or products in your business. Um, they're going to guide you in ways that may not be the best way to maximize the ultimate value of your business. 
Um, they also are very slow to close, um, and they will often ask for rights around, uh, um, John knows better than me, but like rights around a right of first offer or right of first refusal on an acquisition that uh, reduces your choice. Yeah, it has, a, it has a chilling effect for other potential acquirers down the line if they have a, a right of first negotiation or right of first refusal on the company, and, and they'll always ask for that. Cool, thank you, Jonathan and Jules.